think as a scientist and I hope as a believer. But I am not a believer, yet I do want God to exist. My confusion is obvious and continuous and is the reason I encourage science and God to battle, to struggle for ultimate supremacy. Science and God each claims dominion over deep reality. Science, understanding the physical world of regularities and measurements. God, the creation of all that exists, physical and non-physical. But science and religion are not parallel. Everyone sane believes science to be real, while religion has many skeptics and scorners. Scientists think in standardized ways, which is why I focus on scientists, believers and non-believers, to ask the question, can science and God mix? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Can science and God mix is a broader question than do science and God mix. Can asks, is it possible? Do asks, what is the actual fact? I'm already familiar with the arguments of non-believers, scientists who have no need for God to explain what they see and know. That's the reason I skew to scientists who are believers, follow their arguments, discern how they think, to prepare, I start with a Dutch philosopher of religion trained in physics, the editor of Zygon, Journal of Religion and Science, Willem Dries. Wim, I was trained in science and I really have had deep interest in religion. And as I've looked at this relationship, it looks like science is ever advancing and religion is ever retreating. Uh, science is having a lot of progress over the centuries, especially I think the last two centuries, that's clear. Mm. Uh, the other part of it, the suggestion that religion is therefore retreating, I'm not so sure that that's the case. It's more changing character. I think there's a role of religion that maybe in the past was more prominent about understanding reality, uh, well, long, long ago, thinking of thunder as, as divine actions or whatever, uh, which we have abandoned mostly, but I think the more fundamental issues about how to deal with anxieties, with human existence, the wonder of existence, also the positive side, I don't think that disappears through the increase of scientific knowledge. Well, one thing's for sure is that what we know about science, we know with virtual certainty that that's the best explanation at the moment, there's progress. In religion, it's hard to say there's progress. No, I don't think indeed that there is progress in this sense of theoretical knowledge. It's more progress in being maybe more focused on certain values, on certain key issues, and to some extent retreating from kind of pseudo-scientific role. So unlearning certain things may also be progress of, <laughs> no, of not doing the fair. wrong things. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fair. If you're retreating I, from wrong things, I agree with that. But, you know, is there any residue? I think when you do all that, yeah. is there anything left over? Yes, I, I do think there is a residue. There's uh, in two directions, maybe. One is about kind of ultimate gratitude for existence, saying how much you explain there's still any explanation starts somewhere, and the somewhere where it starts itself may be explained, but mm. as a whole, the series still is, uh, well, reason for wonder. Uh, and the other is uh, human ex uh, attitudes in life. I think some of the narratives and the music of religion is, continues to be important to people because it helps, helps them uh, express their, their sorrow, their pain. I mean, that, that's a very different thing. You could get that in uh, you know, civic organizations or different kinds of clubs. Religion maybe imbues it with a certain tradition. Question is, is there an ultimate reality behind it? So right? there's this, this wonder of existence and whether you can fill that in with a divine creator, we just don't know what the answer is. Mm. In terms of personal life, I do have some affinity with the kind of theistic answer, saying, well, there is a, a source of existence, 
but well, it differs by day in a sense. It's not every day the same. <laughs> Me too. Preference. Me too. <laughs> I know f mostly from the religion side that there's a, a sense of bringing harmony and consonance. And at times that, that has actually bothered me because I, I think creating an artificial harmony is, is dangerous because it, it creates human comfort at the expense of truth. This is a business science and religion to access reality. And if it's not that, it's nothing. But so science and reality is, is in, an intellectual effort to, to understand something, but part of uh, religion, at least, is that it's a human practice with all those human dimensions to it, uh, and to play down the human emotional side of it or the existential side of it uh, would miss, I think, some of what religion is about. It would make religion very much like a theory about reality. <laughs> Actually, religion as a theory about reality is precisely what I'm interested in. I appreciate the human, emotional dimensions of religious belief, but at least for now, it's not for me. I want to know deep reality. Is God even possible? So what would it take for religion, centered on God, to be a theory about reality? It must relate to what's real. That means the universe, its origin, structure, future, the field of cosmology. While many cosmologists are agnostics or atheists, a few are in some sense religious. I speak with Princeton professor J. Richard Gott. I rather like what Einstein said. God is subtle but not malicious. <laughs> um, Einstein said that his view of religion was like a child going in a library. He saw all these books and he didn't understand them, but he could see there was something behind all of this and he could get a glimmer of understanding this. Religion is something that I think people have to take on faith. But scientists take things on faith also. Einstein started off with his two hypotheses that uh, motion was relative and that the speed of light was constant. He said, I'm going to take these two on faith and let's see what the consequences of those are. So scientists all the time are hoping that the theory will be pretty and beautiful and they're guided by this. But you know, like many people, their religious views may inform what they do. I certainly think that was the case with Einstein, that his sense of you know, awe and wonder at the world, at the creation that he was seeing, informed his uh, uh, quest, I think. Do you have a feeling as a physicist that what you're seeing uh, uh, enriches your uh, faith? The more we've learned about the universe, I think the more uh, impressive the the universe has has seemed and the tinier if you will <laughs> that, that we have seen at the same time we're complex we're interesting because we're complex we're intelligent observers mm -hmm. it's interesting i think that this is one of the properties that the universe has that uh, we observe that there are intelligent creatures in the universe who can understand something about where they are in the universe the universe seems to be have a currency of information and so forth in it. Information is important in quantum mechanics and in understanding um, us as intelligent observers. We've only been around for 200,000 years in a universe that's 13.7 billion years old. We've asked questions about the universe that we found answers to. So the laws of the physics as they started were consistent with the development of complexity and making an interesting universe that would have observers in it that could apprehend it. I think that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we humans can comprehend the cosmos, and that's astonishing. Just compare. In size, we're minuscule. In time, we're momentary. Yet we've found answers to the cosmos's deepest questions. Does this comprehensibility lead to God? At best, it's consistent with God. It's also consistent with no God. If God and science can indeed mix, there must be a nexus, a point of common connection, a way that God could interact with the world, perhaps without violating the laws of physics some point to quantum mechanics, 
suggesting a world that is less determined and more mysterious, and perhaps in some way related to consciousness. I meet a quantum physicist with a penchant for radical ideas, David Finkelstein. David, you've had a remarkable career as a physicist, extending our knowledge in quantum theory. And you, you've had this remarkable experience with the Dalai Lama and Buddhism, which to some people would sound contradictory. Well, that, that's reasonable. It, it comes out of quantum mechanics, which is pretty con self-contradictory. <laughs> The further you go into quantum mechanics, the harder it is to hold on to any absolutes. Anything you interact with, you change. Before quantum theory, you had the feeling you saw the world as it is. Mm -hmm. And I think after I was in quantum theory for a while, it really became a full letter word for me. <laughs> but you can't make a theory without some absolutes. You begin with some things you don't define that everyone's supposed to understand. And so it, it seemed suicidal to accept the idea that everything is relative. So you couldn't do physics that way, it seemed to me. Then I just happened to be standing behind Professor Robert Thurman of Columbia University, head of their theology department, when he was saying to someone else that in the school of Buddhism of the Dalai Lama, the idea that all is emptiness is understood as all is relative. And boy, did I light up. <laughs> this is the first place I'd heard anybody saying that all is relative. So then I, I was invited to a Mind and Life conference in 97, where we spent five days in dialogue on Buddhist and Western cosmology. Uh, five Western scientists and the Dalai Lama. And that gave me a chance to bring this question up. And it was just in, enormously refreshing. First of all, he took it for granted that everything is relative, that there are quanta of space and quanta of time. I've been working for a long time on quantum space-time. There's the idea of the chronon, the quantum of time, and there's an analogous thing for space. And I, I learned to my pleasure that this too is part of the Dalai Lama's cosmology. And I realized there was a no inconsistency between believing that everything is relative and making physical theories with absolutes in them, you just have to understand that every physical theory is wrong. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> They're good for a certain domain, and, if, and they wear out and they have to be replaced. Uh, so t to function, you, you, you pretend that there are these absolutes that you take for granted, but you don't take them too seriously, and you, you get ready to, re you try to be ready to replace them, or things you haven't even thought of, when they don't work any longer. And did you really profit in your science or your scientific intuition from those interactions? If there isn't going to be a final theory, we have to accept that physics is going to evolve. And as physicists, that means we should have an understanding of how it evolves. So I focused my energy not on finding the theory, but on trying to find the path that theories take. And what, what I learned was to adopt a more thoroughgoing empirical approach. That's really the, the core of the Dalai Lama's philosophy, mm. that all knowledge is empirical. Another thing we grooved on is the empirical nature of logic. He was interested in the ideas of quantum logic, intuition, intuitionistic logic, and so forth, because they're all based on experience. They're not based on faith. All is relative is profound, and I'd welcome insights shared by quantum physics and Buddhism. But as a foundation of meaning, all is relative seems rather thin. Buddhism is not about God anyway, I'm told, so it's rather irrelevant. I don't agree. Buddhism's claim is that fundamental reality lies beyond the physical. So even rejecting a Western monotheistic personal creator Buddhism can represent God broadly conceived as supernatural or non-physical existence. Although I focus on scientists who are in some sense believers, many scientists, of course, reject the whole project of God, most by utter indifference, some by aggressive repudiation. 
I visit NYU neuroscientist Rodolfo Vinas. How does he reject God? Rodolfo, speaking as a scientist, how, how do you view the, the capacity of science to even be discussing things about God? Okay, so as a scientist, uh, I use scientific method to think. Scientific method requires a well-known set of steps that you should have a hypothesis that you can test. If you don't have hypothesis or you have hypotheses that are not in principle testable, uh, this then becomes a bit of a problem. If you consider a, a uh, situation where by definition scientific method cannot be utilized, then I have to say from a scientific point of view is not a question that I can understand from the point of view of a cognitive uh, function of the brain, in the sense of the, co the cognitive function of the brain, in order to be able to understand, it requires to be able to understand the origin. You have to have a, a historical event that has to do with causality, A causes B causes C. So you have to be able to trace it back to something. So if you, if you cannot, as a scientist, have a traceable causal uh, a continuity, or you cannot apply the scientific method, does that mean, A, that I just can't discuss the question, or then, by definition, it, is, it is, doesn't exist? I mean, we can exclude it from reality. Big difference. I, absolutely a huge difference. Um, so the way I address it is slightly different. The way I address it is, uh, what is the probability? If I go there, I have no problem. I simply say, listen, uh, the probability is so extraordinarily low that while not being able to discard it, I find it so unlikely as to I don't have to worry about it. it and it's a serious answer, although it sounds like I'm coughing out. That's not simply not the case. Okay, I, I, I would accept that. Now let's find out why you, you assign God, as a scientist, a very low probability because either it is, it is uh, applicable and discernible some things with the scientific method or not. Because it's total inability, the total inability has that, that God has to implement anything, to be in any form discernible. I have no measure possible. And I know that even those who believe in God deeply know that there is no possible way. So, since there is no, no possible way for of discerning its existence. Of proving his existence. No, discern, measure something that tells me that God exists. Anything. So, are we saying that discernment is the same thing as measurement? Yes, indeed. If you cannot measure, you cannot discern. Absolutely. I, I'm, a log I'm a logical positivist. I require to be able to have a hypothesis that is testable. This is a hypothesis that is not sensible. Does that imply that it doesn't exist? No, but it implies it has a very low probability. Yeah. When atheists argue the non-existence of God from the flaws of religion, which indeed are as egregious as they are ubiquitous, I resist. I am not of the view that the existence of God can be undermined by the dysfunctions of religions. It'd be rather absurd to discount the possible reality of an almighty creator of the cosmos because human religious organizations are inept or immoral. I'm never surprised when scientists deny the existence of God. I'm intrigued when scientists affirm God, especially when they speculate about doctrines of God. Don Page is a theoretical physicist who studied with Stephen Hawking. He's a well-known believer, I hear, with strong idiosyncratic views that couldn't pass for mainstream in either science or religion. How does Don mix science and God? Don, you are a physicist. You believe in God. What are some of the problems that you face? Well, I've often said that the biggest problem that I face is, is just the, the, the problem of evil. And so I do believe that God has created the best possible world, but that there's a trade-off between different things. And, I, and in my case, I see huge value in the mathematical elegance of the universe, but that has a trade-off that these very elegant laws that God has chosen to use 
often lead to suffering within the universe. Okay, what else? So, um, I mean, another thing that did face me several years ago is what I call the afterlife awareness problem. This is arising from what's called the doomsday argument. And this was the issue that if you had different hypotheses for how long human life might last, one in which there's rough, you know, not that many more people to live after us that have lived before, that's hypothesis A, Frax, and hypothesis B, that life would go on for a very long time, there'd be far more humans in, the, in hypothesis B. Well, in hypothesis B, we would be unusually early, so the probability of us seeing ourselves so early would be low. So this counts as evidence against hypothesis B. But then I did realize another version of this is that if I also included uh, not just people here on Earth, but if I included all conscious awarenesses, both in this world and in an afterlife, which I believe in, then I realized that it, the common view that the afterlife consists of an infinite sequence of, of observations, if each one of those had equal probability or equal measure in some sense, that all the measure would be concentrated on the afterlife and there would be no probability left for us to be here. <laughs> so therefore, our observation that we are here rather than in the afterlife was counted as evidence against this particular version of the afterlife theory. Yeah. <laughs> so that did bother me, but I did eventually think that there's a possible solution to this, which is related to some similar problem, so-called measure problem in cosmology, that different experiences don't have to have the same measure. And so it occurred to me, it's conceivable that even if there are an infinite number of conscious experiences in the afterlife, that well, it might be that the total measure or, or, or the total probability, if you chose a perception at random, to be in the afterlife is not infinitely bigger than the present. But that means that you are devaluing experiences in the afterlife compared to this life, which contradicts your theology. Well, I'm, de I'm devaluating it in comparison to the infinite value that it might have traditionally had. I, I'm not devaluing it with respect to the present because I'm, I'm not saying that it has to be less. I'm not even saying that the measure has to be less than the present. It's just that it, 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 it can't be hugely more. But of course, besides the measure, there's also the intrinsic value of each right. experience. Right, and that right. could be great. I mean, it could be that God has great ecstasy in store for us. And so, so you have two problems in the afterlife. One is the, see the number of perceptions, which right, right. if life is infinite, it seems however long each one lasts, this is also infinite because infinite. Uh, right, right. Yeah. And the second is, is the value of each perception. And if that's much better than it is today, then you have a double problem. And so you can't solve it by, by making afterlife perceptions smaller than the ones we have here. Well, I don't think, I don't see that the value by itself is a problem. I mean, if, if the, let's suppose for the sake of argument that you said the measure was the same for the afterlife or for here. Right. Then that would say that if you imagine choosing a perception at random out of the total all, all perceptions from the, our life and the afterlife, you get a 50% chance it's here. No, so it's, no, no, but, 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 but you have an infinite afterlife and we have a finite Well, I, I agree that the total number of years would be greater, but I'm saying there is a concept of the measure of each experience. You imagine each experience is being created by God for a certain amount of his time. I'm not saying this is the way it is or even the way I believe it is. I'm just saying that if you suppose that, that God gave a certain experience in the afterlife say one second of his time, and the next one a half second, and the next one a fourth, and so on. The total God time for it would then be two seconds for, for that. And then maybe the pre-life count for another two seconds or something. It's the probabilistic reasoning that ran me into trouble with the afterlife. I, I was getting that the likelihood of a theory of, of an afterlife was tending towards zero because I was putting all the probability on, on experience being afterlife, which gave zero probability for the present life. Right. So I'm saying this model- You know that's wrong. Well, we're not absolutely sure because there's also the prior probability. So if you're absolutely sure afterlife existed, then it would still be consistent. I mean, there, it's, there's nothing impossible about it. It's just that if you said that you had a prior probability uh, of greater than zero, that there isn't an afterlife, then if you went through this argument, then afterwards you'd have a posterior probability that would be, well, very high that there is no afterlife. So it depends on your priors. And, and you, you could say, well, we're just certain because of Don applies scientific thinking to theological issues, mixing in his way science and God. His argument against an afterlife in which he himself believes exemplifies difficulties in doctrines of God. Are science and God spheres of truth that complement, not contradict? Good spirited harmonizers would have it be so. While I reject anodyne harmony between science and God, I recognize that the relationship is not symmetrical. 
When God is invoked to make claims about science, such as the age of the universe, scientists do not take them seriously. But when science makes claims about God, such as no soul, no afterlife, believers must take them seriously, even if they decide, for reasons of faith, to reject the critique. The best believers can do is to show, or try to show, that science is not inconsistent with the God they proclaim. So, can science and God mix? Yes, but how well? Science and God are like water and oil, liquids that mix but do not blend. Shake them together, still they remain distinct. For me for now, that's closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.